it's a modified leaf and it's, it's been modified over evolutionary time to form this cup. And the pitcher produces nectar around the edge and on the lid here. That nectar attracts mainly insects um, which fall in and drown in the pool inside. And inside there's this, oops, inside there's this whole little aquatic ecosystem. So there's this pool that's formed partially from secretions from the plant, um, but mostly from rainwater. And in that pool, there's a whole community of organisms that thrive. So there are insects that are specialized on pitcher plant systems, these aquatic insects. Um, there's mites, there's rotifers, there's protozoa, there's bacteria, there's fungal yeasts. And there's in this system, there's predators and prey, there's decomposers, there's primary producers. So you have this whole dynamic um, ecosystem going on, but it's on a smaller scale. And there are many different reasons why I think these make great model ecosystems. One is that you have this small, easily defined area. Um, and that's one thing in, in community ecology that can be hard to find, is that you have this this small sort of isolated community. It's like a little aquatic island. Um, they have this tube-like shape. So bringing them into the lab is not such a stretch. You know, it's not quite the same as when you have the ocean and you bring a little bit of the ocean and it's very different. This is already sort of that contained tube-like shape. It's naturally replicated. So um, in the habitat, you can have many different pitchers that are growing on the same plant in the same environment. And it has this host microbiome association. So we think that in a lot of ways, the pitcher community is sort of like a gut because it's, it's helping its host to break down and access nutrients from its prey, from its food. So it's this nice kind of plant analog of an animal's gut. And because it has this host microbiome association, it also has some pretty clear ecosystem functions which can be difficult to find as well, right? What, what functions really matter in a lot of ecosystems? It's hard sometimes for us to determine that. But in this system, this breakdown and decomposition of insect prey is something that we know is really um, allowing nutrients to enter into this aquatic pool and also for the host plant to be able to absorb. So these plants grow in really low nutrient ecosystems and they get a lot of their nitrogen and phosphorus from the insects that they eat. This is showing an evolutionary tree of, of plants, of flowering plants, um, and mapped onto it are the separate evolutions of carnivory in plants. So you can see that carnivory has evolved multiple times independently in plants. And I want to highlight the pitcher plants. So here are the Nepenthesiae. These are found in Southeast Asia. There's many different species. Um, these are the Cephalotaceae. This is a family that's found just in Western Australia, and there's only a single species in this family. And then there are the Saraceniaceae, and these are found in the Americas, and there are many different species as well. Um, and these different groups are, are in fundamentally different groups of plants, and they've evolved completely independently, but they have the same cup-shaped uh, leaves. Um, they have a lot of the same sort of colors, the red and green coloration, um, and they have the same function of trapping and digesting insects. I started this experiment by just trying to understand what organisms live in the pitchers, who's there. Um, this was relatively well known for insects, but not so much on the microbial level. And so uh, we collected over 700 different samples in North America, Southeast Asia, and Australia from pitcher plants and also from their surroundings, so from the bog water or from the soil that surrounds them. And we did metabarcoding of the bacteria and the eukaryotes, and then for, from a subset of our samples, we did shotgun metagenomes to look at overall functional potential. And what we found in terms of who's there is that in, for eukaryotes, it's mostly these specialized mosquitoes, midges, mites, and then fungi, protozoa, and algae. And in terms of bacteria, it's mostly proteobacteria, bacteroidetes, actinobacteria, and acidobacteria. So one of the questions I was interested in is if succession is really leading to change in these pitcher communities over time. And this was a, an experiment that I did with an undergrad, um, Elizabeth Benson, 
she was looking specifically in one species, Nepenthes mirabilis, and she started out by looking at pitchers that had not yet opened. And before they open, they're sterile or very close to sterile. And then the community colonizes from the environment. And so what she found was that consistent with this, um, in terms of both bacteria and eukaryotes, there was sort of this increase that happened across weeks. So she investigated the same pitchers over time from when they opened and then the following four weeks. So in terms of just the richness, we see this, this increase happening over time. And then in terms of the composition, we see that there is this trajectory happening. So here, this is an NMDS plot. And the most important thing to know for, about these plots is that each point is representing the entire bacterial community from a single pitcher. And then if these two points are close together, those bacterial communities are more similar to each other. If they're further apart, they're more dissimilar. So what you can see is that there's this sort of, it, there's a lot of variability within a week, right? But you also see that there's this progression happening over time. So we do see this successional change in the community composition across weeks. We also wanted to know to what extent environmental filtering may be altering these pitcher communities. And we wanted to look at it on two different scales. The first was at the genus level. So looking among the different species within a single genus. And then the other was looking at pitcher plants, plants in general. So sort of this pitcher plant habit. Um, and for this first part, for looking across the different, the two genera, we focused on the Nepenthes and Saracenia. And I was comparing these eight different species of Nepenthes and these six different species of Saracenia. And so these are, um, you can see they have different shapes and structures and coloration. Um, and I, I targeted locations where there were multiple species that were all growing together in the same habitat. And you do find this with these plants, that there's sites where you can have, you know, three or more different species growing together. So what we did find was that within each genus, the host species identity influences the pitcher communities. And I wanted to know more about what might be driving this. What we found was that um, certain characteristics of the pitchers drive composition differences. For the Nepenthes, the, the strongest driver was the pH or the acidity of the pitcher fluid. And the Nepenthes can actually do this amazing thing where they excrete hydrogen ions into the fluid and really acidify it. So you get these super acidic pitchers around 1.5. So here's an NMDS plot and these are now colored by the acidity of the pitcher fluid. And you can see that there's this progression from acidic to more neutral pitchers and a strong correlation between the composition of the community and the acidity of that pitcher fluid, which might be expected. In the Saracenia, they don't have these extremes in acidity. And instead we see that shape and volume has a, a stronger effect. So these, some pitchers have these tall sort of narrow fluted shape and others are more squat and round. And that had a stronger um, effect on the communities. And I wanna highlight that these, both of these effects were much stronger than the effects of dispersal. So for example, we would find two pitchers that were right next to each other, um, but if they had very different pH levels, they would have very different communities. If they had very different shapes, they would have different communities. Whereas um, like a pitcher in, Massachusetts and in Florida that had similar shape, they tended to have more similar community. So we do see that on this genus level, um, environmental filtering alters these pitcher communities. When you look on a kind of narrow scale, we definitely find that these characteristics of particular pitchers have a really strong effect on the composition. So I also wanted to look at the pitcher plant habit in general. And I was comparing the Nepenthes and the Saracenia again. Um, and here, I just wanna highlight how distantly related these are to each other. So they're as distantly related as cacti are to blueberries. When people first found these plants, they thought that maybe they came from the same family, but then now we really know that this is a very clear example of convergent evolution. And I was curious to what extent this convergent evolution may also drive convergence in terms of the communities that associate with them. So what we found was that the Nepenthes and Saracenia, even though they're on opposite sides of the world, um, generally are colonized by organisms that come from the same phylogenetic clades. So here what I'm showing you is a 
evolutionary tree of bacteria. And these are the bacteria that are found in across this study. Um, on the outside here in brown are all the different bacterial species that are found in bog water or soil that was surrounding the pitcher plant habitat. And then here in red and in blue are all the different bacteria that are found in at least 10% of, of either the Nepenthes or the Saracenia. So I wanted to focus on, on organisms that were found repeatedly and commonly within these pitchers that seem to be um, associates instead of just sort of randomly showing up there from the environment. And what you see is that they tend to come from these same groups when you look really broadly. Um, you don't necessarily have the same ASVs or species, um, but you do see that they generally come from these similar groups. And you see the same thing for eukaryotes, although it's a little more restricted here. Um, you see it for the histiomatid mites, the dipteran insects, and the rotifers. So you see different organisms, um, but they come from these same groups. And this suggests that potentially they fulfill similar functions within these little aquatic pools. And to look a little bit more at potential function, we, we hypothesized that these pitcher plants would be enriched in genes for prey degradation. So we looked at chitinase genes since chitin is the main biopolymer in these insect exoskeletons. And we did find that in the metagenomes of the Nepenthes and the Saracenia, they were enriched in chitinases as compared to other published metagenomes from phyllospheres, lake, and soil habitats. And then conversely, we hypothesized that they would be depleted in um, enzymes for degrading cellulose because cellulose is plant material. And we thought that these, these pitcher plant communities are not degrading plant material as much as they are degrading insect material. And we did find that in general, they were depleted. So it does suggest that we may be seeing sort of a convergence in the types of interactions that appear um, on this very broad scale, looking at the pitcher plant habit and the organisms that associate with it. So we see it on both of these scales. And if we come back to this slide, um, what we've seen so far is that succession does um, have an impact on changing the composition of these communities over time. And environmental filtering plays a really large role in what organisms are surviving and thriving within pitchers. And then dispersal was not as important. So we did see some effects of dispersal and of distance, but it was not, it did not have as large of an impact as, as this environmental filtering did. I can pause here for a minute. Does anyone have questions? I don't see any question in the chat or uh, in the participant list. So I think we can uh, move on and uh, yeah. So I really wanted to also think about historical contingency. And it's a little bit more difficult to examine because you can imagine that if I was trying to just look for it out in the wild, um, you don't really know the history of these different pictures. You don't know sort of what slightly slight differences in, in environmental characteristics. I think you're muted. All right. Yeah. I was thinking, I was interested in asking if historical contingency is also affecting the composition and function in pitcher communities. The common perception for bacterial communities is that environmental filtering dominates. And I think part of the reason that this is the common perception is that it is um, much easier to measure. And also composition and function have, have been found to converge under the same environmental conditions. But a lot of times this is because the experiments that are really controlled, so you need a really controlled experiment to be able to understand if, if um, contingencies are playing a role. But in a lot of these controlled experiments, they've been done um, in artificial media with single or few carbon sources. And I think that this also restricts your ability to see these, um, these effects. So I worked on this experiment with Gabriel Leventhal and Mari Gralka. We were all postdocs in Otto Cordero's lab at the time. 
And we started out with 10 unique pitchers. These were all coming from the same species now and from the same bog. And fluid uh, filtered the fluid through three micron filters to be able to focus on the bacterial component of the community and then used this sterilized acidified ground cricket in water. So I wanted to have a really complex medium that was also really similar to what these communities would be uh, consuming in their natural habitat. Then I would grow them for three days and every three days I would take half the volume and move it to a new tube um, and did this 21 times over 63 days. During the experiment, we measured the relative abundances with metabarcoding, the carbon dioxide production with a micro rasp, the functional fingerprint with these eco plates, which looks at about 30 different um, substrates to see how the communities can metabolize them. And then we also looked at chitinase activity because we already knew how to identify chitinases as an important uh, ecosystem function in, this, in these types of communities. What we found was that these communities equilibrate over time. So this is showing that the dissimilarity of the communities between adjacent days was pretty high at the beginning and then um, decreased over time. So the communities became more similar to each other over adjacent days in the experiment. But even though they equilibrated around here after about three weeks in the lab, we found that there were still differences in terms of the richness of these communities. So they were different in the effective number of species that were present, and there were pretty large differences. And it wasn't just the richness, it was also the composition. So these communities were still composed of very different species. And I'm not showing the family level here, but we also saw differences at the family level. Um, not as extreme as the differences at the species level, but but there, were, there was not complete convergence at the family level. So what we found was that the historical contingencies do have a lasting effect on the community composition. And here I'm showing an NMDS plot where um, the, the sort of beginning point of the experiment is here um, next to the microcosm name. And then you can see over time, there's this initial large shift. And this initial large shift is due to environmental selection because basically we're taking these out of pictures and we're moving them into a lab environment. So very quickly, there's this fast initial change and that's because these communities are adapting now to a pretty different environment. We're trying to keep it as similar as, as it was to its, its picture, but obviously it's gonna be different when you move it into the lab. But now all these communities are, you know, getting exactly the same food source they have exactly the same temperature, they're in the same volume, um, they have the same light. And so despite that, we see that there are still these persistent differences in the communities, and these are due to historical contingency because all the conditions are being held exactly the same now. So what's left is sort of the history of these different communities. So what about community function? Um, we found when we looked at carbon dioxide that the carbon dioxide did converge over time. So this is the variance and the percent CO2 produced across different microcosms. At the beginning it was higher and then it very quickly decreased and became similar over time. So sort of overall they had similar levels of metabolic activity. But historical contingency affects the more specific functions. So when you look at this functional fingerprint from the ecoplates, we see that these distinct differences remain at the end of the experiment. Um, here we're seeing composition in uh, the circles and function are the triangles. This is a Procrustes plot. They're both um, Bray Curtis dissimilarities. And then we see, you know, to what extent do they correlate with each other? And you actually see that function strongly correlates with the composition in these communities. So these the compositional differences remain and these functional differences remain. And in terms of chitinases, this is also true. So here I'm showing you five out of the 10 different communities and both MO3 and MO9 had really high chitinase production um, compared with the other communities. And then we, we had cultured um, some of these strains. So we cultured a bunch of the strains from these five different communities. 
measured their chitinase activity alone as a, just um, as an individual strain, and then mapped that back to the corresponding ASVs. And what you can see is that for MO3, it was really one strain that contributed to this high chitinase activity. Whereas in MO4, there were three different strains that each had really high chitinase activity and together they contributed to this high activity of the community. So I thought this was cool because it means that you can um, take the, the activity from the individual strains and that this can be directly related to the community function. We think that species interactions are contributing to the historical contingency. And this is because we found that ASVs that are shared or species, so ASVs are species that are shared among different microcosms have different dynamics depending on which microcosm they're in. And one thing here I'm going to show you is that the, the trajectories, the sort of uh, trajectories of their dynamics over time are more similar when the communities that they are in are more similar. So we saw this interesting correlation that if they have a more similar community, they also have more similar dynamics within that community. And, um, and this seems to relate to species interactions that are likely happening within these complex communities. I wanted to highlight a couple of other interesting findings from this experiment, because I think they're related to some of the things we're talking about in, in this workshop. Um, one thing we found was that the early richness of the community predicted the final richness. So not necessarily on day zero, because on day zero, I think we had a lot of things that were not metabolically active or that were not adapted to living in this lab environment. But on day three, so after the communities had been in the lab just for one transfer, we found that they were strongly correlated with the richness at the end of the experiment. And if we normalized the richness of the communities by the richness on day three, and then looked at how that changed over time, you can see that they equilibrate at this universal rate. So we do see these strong differences in the, um, the richness of these different communities. And we see that species interactions likely matter, but they do also seem to equilibrate at this, they, they lose ASVs over time at this stable rate. We also found that the community assembly trajectory was really reproducible. So this was using filtered and unfiltered samples that were in the same condition. So I told you that I'd filtered the, you know, the primary samples for this experiment were filtered, but I also had a set that were unfiltered because I was curious about protozoa and what would happen to them in this lab context. And what we found was that if you compare the filtered and the unfiltered communities, they actually follow really similar trajectories when you look at a Bray Curtis dissimilarity. So this is exciting to me because I think it suggests that if you had enough information about the, the history of communities, um, then you could really predict how they change um, over time when they come into the same environment. So what we see here was that um, historical contingencies can also play a role in determining the composition of these communities and can affect ecosystem function. So one thing that maybe you've noticed I left out was evolution. And we continued this experiment to look at community dynamics over, over evolutionary timescales. Um, this was led by Akshit Goyal at MIT, and um, we've just posted the preprint um, this month, earlier this month. So we continued this experiment for about a year, looking at more than 300 generations, and did additional deep metagenomic sequencing and mapped back to genomes from the strains that I had cultured from these different communities. We found that most of the variation and most of the evolution arose from pre-existing genetic variants belonging to the same species. So there were these strains that you could not tell apart by their 16S, um, but they actually played large roles in, in the change in these communities over time. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about one aspect of this paper and then I'll end. Um, but we found that even highly related strains that were about 100 SNPs apart can decouple in their dynamics. So this is an example of what it looks like when you have coupled major and minor strains of the same species. And this is what it might look like if you have decoupled strains. 
And so the majority were coupled, but there was this subset that were decoupled. And these decoupled ones, this is was the was the where basically it split. So at about 100 SNPs is where we started to see differences in the trajectories of these, these strains. And this is an example of a consequence of the strain decoupling. So this is one ASV, and this major strain stays pretty similar over time. But you see here that after you know around 200 generations, this minor strain started growing. We found that most of the community interactions happening were at the strain level. So this is looking at the interaction strength or the species-species correlation, and this is the strain-strain correlation or interaction strength. So the majority were happening at the strain level. And this is an example of these hidden interactions between minor strains. So when you look at just the species or the ASVs here, you don't see any correlation. But if you look at these minor strains, they had a pretty strong negative correlation. So they were um, highly negatively correlated. If you want to know more about this study, there's a lot more to it. Um, also looking at different the different gene families and, and gene groups that were um, that were behind these dynamics, you can look at this preprint. So I want to end just by coming back to this and thinking about these really complex and interesting microbial communities that can drive a lot of important dynamics happening in our ecosystems and in our own bodies. And I hope I've convinced you that um, pitcher plants can be used as these cool model ecosystems to be able to better understand some of these processes that may be behind these, these interesting dynamics. I want to thank the labs where this work was done. Um, many places gave me permissions to do field work and funding sources. And with that, thank all of you for listening and I can answer some questions. Great, thanks a lot uh, for the very nice talk. There are, uh, in fact, a few questions in the chat, but uh, uh, yes, I can start from those, and then if someone wants to ask a question, can uh, raise the hand and talk. So uh, Martina uh, is asking, do you see any evidence of gene loss in species evolving in the same picture? Yeah, so there was some evidence of gene loss. Um, and part of it was, or you mean in the same picture or in this, in this, in the microcosms in the lab environment? Uh, in the microcosm, in the, yeah. in the, yeah. during the evolution experiment. Yeah, so there was some, um, there was some loss of phage um, resistance and potentially that might be because phages, we also, you know, didn't directly measure phages, but um, but in the in the metagenomes, we didn't see a lot of activity of phages there. So um, so there seemed to be some loss in sort of defensive um, genes. And let's see, there was another group, but I'm forgetting it off the top of my head right now. But yeah, we did see some particular gene loss happening. Uh, great. There is a question from Simon Levin, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I have two questions. One of them is um, all the experiments you did, at least in the lab, would seem to suggest that this is an ideal system for thinking about a metapopulation approach with some aspects of island biogeography within the patches and maybe taking into account uh, how the pitcher plants grow over time and whether the community changes just like a patch dynamic approach. So mm -hmm. I wondered whether you thought about taking a modeling approach incorporating that. And, and the second question is, to what extent can you look at um, the phylogenies of the species that are <laughs> occupying the plants and plants themselves if there's no evolution going on? Yeah, yeah, those are really interesting questions. Um, in terms of thinking about the metapopulation dynamics and the, the patch dynamics, yeah, I think that would be really interesting. And I think one way to do that would be to have these sorts of separate communities in the lab, but have some level, some sort of low level of dispersal happening among them. And one of the first experiments we've done that kind of addresses that is we did um, coalescence experiments where we combined all of these different communities in, in all of the possible combinations um, and then looked at how that changed over time. And I'm still analyzing that data, so I haven't dug into it that much yet. But that was one way of thinking about but that's like a very large scale dispersal. And I think it would be really cool to be able to think more about um, 
What, yeah. what about the field day? In the field? Yeah. Yeah, I think you could also do it in the field. Yeah, it's, it would definitely be harder to, to control, but you can, yeah, I think that would be a great way as well. And, and the co -evolution. Asking about co-evolution of different species. So I think it's really hard to measure, right? Because you want to see if there's reciprocal change in different species happening over time. And that reciprocal change can be, can be difficult to find. Um, but I, I would love to look more into that. And I think that the pitcher, so the pitcher plants, each pitcher is an individual leaf. And in some, they only last a couple of months. In some, they last up to two years, depending on the species. So I think that there is time potentially in a pitcher to have co-evolution of the organisms inside happening. And then there may be some potential to have co-evolution happening between the organisms that are associated with the pitcher and the plant. Obviously the time scale of the um, lifespan is really different. Um, and so I think I it would- I meant over a longer period of time by looking at the phylogeny. Yeah. So I think that you could probably, my guess is that you would probably see something like that happening with the insect associates because you have these insects that seem really specialized on the pitcher habitat. Their particular characteristics of like the mosquitoes no longer are blood feeding that, that tend to be pitcher inhabitants. Um, so they have sort of different characteristics from, from what you might expect. Um, yeah, I would love to be able to look at that more. It's something that I've talked about a lot with Nomi Pierce, um, particularly with the insects, but I don't know so much with the microbes because you don't have this persistent vertical transmission happening. It seems like a lot of the microbes are coming from the surrounding environment, so may also have other habitats that they're thriving in. They're not so specialized as the insect inhabitants, for example. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question. Uh, yes, I think uh, we have uh, uh, time for a very uh, quick question uh, from Mercedes. Yes, thank you. Very fascinating to see in the evolutionary experiments the different levels of organization, the importance of within species variation to the community, which I think is something we don't think enough in community ecology. My question was, uh, have you found any relationship between strain diversity um, the, the size, the, the sort of uh, diversity of the assembled community, and also how these change over succession or uh, what, how they change in time. So you're thinking that maybe in communities that have fewer species, they have more strains? Is that no, the other way around, that somehow oh. there is a synergy between uh, the diversification within the species yeah. and, and the richness of the assembly. So, and perhaps a feedback in both directions, which would kind of uh, uh, lead us back to the question on the, on the species pool at a, at a larger level, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't dug into that. I should look into that more. Yeah, actually it was leading the, um, the analyses for the strain dynamics. So I'll, I'll ask him for, for his tables because I don't have all the details of exactly how many were in it each. It would be fascinating because it's a very unexplored area, which I think is super important. This yeah. kind of, you know, and potentially interactions at these level, different levels of organization. Yeah, thank you. That's a great idea.